A blessed and pleasant morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, and welcome to another edition of Morning Prayer, brought to you by the Anglican Diocese of Belize. It's a lovely day here in Dangriga this morning. Outside, the wind is howling, the sky is gray, but the birds are chirping and sounding very happy. So I think we should take from their cue and be just as happy as they are. We're going to kick things off this beautiful Friday morning with this one entitled, I want to walk as a child of the light. Let's have a listen. And this morning we are celebrating the Feast of St. Vincent and, <clears throat> pardon me, oh, choking a little bit here. And this morning we are celebrating the Feast of St. Vincent de Paul and Louis de Mar Mariac. Those are the two saints we are celebrating today. So let's get our words here up on screen for that then. And I can make that happen as soon as this computer Cooperates in three, two, and one. There we go. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to my father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Words from Luke chapter 1, verse 18 and Using verse 1 on page 35, if you are following along in your books of common prayer. 
Blessed be the Lord our God, by whose grace we are yet alive. Blessed be his Son, Jesus Christ, by whose rising we are set free. Blessed be the Spirit of God, in whom is our hope and our joy. Our invitatory prayer. Father, we come together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, to offer you our worship, praise, and thanksgiving. You who belong all power and glory. You are the source of all things. Let our worship bear witness to your peace and saving power. Through your spirit, may we ever rejoice in the abiding presence of our risen and ascended Lord. Our first canticle for this morning is the Canticle de Vedite, which is based on Psalm 95, verses 1 through 8, and can be found on page 36 in our book. Oh, come, let us sing out to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph for the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving and cry out to him joyfully in psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. His hands are the depths of the earth, and the peaks of the mountains are his also. Seize his, and he made it. His hands molded dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he himself is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. If only you would hear his voice today, for he comes, comes to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness, and the peoples with his truth. At this time, we pause to call to mind those things that, in thought, word, or deed, we may have committed, things that might have been displeasing to Almighty God, things that might have been unjust to our neighbors, things perhaps that might have been unkind even to our very selves. For these times and these moments, Lord, we pray to you for the forgiveness of our sins. Together we pray. Have mercy upon us, most merciful. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life, the honor and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life, which you have made known to us in your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our psalm appointed for this morning is Psalm 102. Let's have a listen. Psalm 102. Lord, hear my prayer. Let my cry come before you. Hide not your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to hear me. When I call, make haste to answer me. For my days drift away like snow, and my bones are hot as burning. My heart is smitten like grass, and withered, so that I forget to eat my bread. Because of the voice of my groaning, I am but skin. I have become like a vulture in the woods, like an owl among the birds. I lie awake and I am like a sparrow, lonely in the house. My enemies revile me all day long. And those who scoff at me have taken an oath against me. For I have eaten ashes for bread and mingled my drink. Because of your indignation and wrath, you have lifted me up and thrown me away. My days pass away like a shadow and I wither like the grass. But you, O oh God, endure forever, and your name from age to age. You will arise and have compassion on Zion, for it is time to have mercy upon you. Indeed, the appointed time has come for your servant's love for very rubble, and our move to pity when for it. Nations shall fear your will. And all the kings of the earth your glory. For the Lord will build up Zion. 
this glory will appear. He will look with favor on the prayer of the book. He will not despise them. Let this be written for our future generation, so that the people yet were born may be For the Lord looks down from his holy place on high. From the heavens he beheld the earth, that he might hear the groan of the earth, and set free those condemned by him, that they may declare in Zion the king and his praise in Jerusalem. When the peoples are gathered, and the king also circled, he has brought down my strength before me. He has shot with the number of them. And I said, O oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years endure throughout all your Beginning, O oh Lord, made the foundation of God. And the heavens are the works of your They shall perish, you will it. They all shall wear out like that. As clothing, you will change them. They shall be changed. But you are always the same. And your years are ready. The children of your servants shall be. Offspring shall stand fast. Our second canticle for this morning is canticle number 14, a song of praise. O Lord and ruler of the host of heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of all their righteous offspring, you made the heavens and the earth with all their vast array. All things quake with fear at your presence. They tremble because of your power. But your merciful promise is beyond all measure. It surpasses all that our minds can have. O oh Lord, you are full of compassion, long suffering, and abounding. You hold back your hand, you don't punish as we deserve. In your great goodness, Lord, you have promised forgiveness to sinners. They may repent of their sin, be saved. And now, O oh Lord, I bend the knee of my heart and make my appeal sure of your gracious goodness. I have sinned, O oh Lord, I have sinned. And I know my wickedness only. Therefore, I make this prayer to you. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. Do not let me perish in my sin. Nor condemn me to For you, O Lord, are the God of those who do. And in me will show forth your goodness. Unworthy as I am, save me. In accordance with your goodness. And I will praise you without ceasing all the days of heaven. For all the powers of heaven sing your praises. Yours is the glory, ages of ages. Our Bible reading comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 9, verse 2 to 13. Let's have it. A reading from the Word of God written in the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 9, verse 2. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured with them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could touch them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be. Let us make three dwellings. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrible. Then the cloud overshadowed them. From the cloud they came up. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen 
until after the Son of Man has risen. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what was rising from the dead. Then they asked him, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He said to them, Elijah is indeed coming first to restore all things. How then is it written about the Son of Man that he is to go through many suffering, treated with him? But I pray that Elijah has come. Did to him whatever he wants, as it is with him. Heard. Thanks. If you would be so kind as to allow me a seconds to be back to this one from Mark chapter 9, verse 13. And it should be up on your screen. This portion of scripture, of course, is taken from the Transfiguration scripture. And we have spoken about the Transfiguration in the past. It's been what, three years since we've been doing one prayer. My goodness, that is a lot of time. Praise be to Jesus. And this portion here from the Gospel according to Mark chapter 9 is a, a beautiful one in terms of what it reveals with regards to the nature of Jesus. But at the end of all of it, <laughs> at the end of all of it, the, the whole idea between the cross and the glory exists. And Jesus is, of course, transfigured before the three who are generally always with him according to Scripture. Peter, James, and John. And most people assume that Jesus took these three aside on this occasion and other occasions because they were special favorites of the Lord. But you know what? It could possibly be that they were more likely to get in trouble why Jesus kept a close eye on them. And what started as it would appear a mountain retreat quickly changed to glory, um, to the glorification of Jesus. Yes, Jesus was up there and he was transformed before their eyes. His glory shone bright. And white like nothing could be bleached on earth. And Mark does, I guess he does his best, to try to describe for us what Jesus looked like. No doubt through the eyes of Peter. Because, well, um, James and John weren't the ones who were quickly to, to, to say or describe anything, right? But um, Peter, hmm, Peter was the dude. He seemed to always be on the forefront, like we heard him call Jesus the Messiah yesterday in the Gospel. And it's interesting because if we're not careful, we might think of the transfiguration just as a bright light shining on Jesus. And that's that's not it, yes? Because the reading tells us that they were high up on the mountain place, he was transfigured, and his clothes became like dazzling white, such as no one on earth could reach them. But they, we, we shouldn't think that there was light shining around Jesus, yes? The transfiguration experience is not about light shining from behind or above or around Jesus. Jesus was the light. He was the one that was glory. The glory of God, pardon me, was in him. So he was not masquerading in light. It was not an outward light that was shining on him from the outside. No, this was an inner light that was shining out of him. You know, a masquerade um, comes from outward and does not change what is inside. But this light of Jesus that was glowing so bright was a light that came from inside. And this is, is not necessarily a miracle that Jesus is glowing. It is just his glory being displayed for human eyes, you know? And I guess Jesus did this in the presence of his disciples because he had just told them that he was going on the way to the cross. And remember that happened yesterday and how he had to um, make Peter understand that he was not living with the mind of the kingdom um, present. And, and and it was, I guess, these three, James and John who wanted power, and, and Peter who was so quick to proclaim him as the Messiah, I guess it was necessary for them to see that while they were thinking of earthly leadership, this leadership clearly was beyond whatever they could think. The fact that they saw the raised Moses and the raised Elijah um, with Jesus, they, these were men who were prophets who hold great significance um, in Old Testament scripture and at that time would have been men who 
held great prominence in Jewish teachings. They still hold great prominence in Jewish teachings, but for Peter, James, and John to, to be in the presence of Moses and Elijah. And somebody playfully asked me the day before yesterday, how did Peter, James, and John know that it was Elijah and Moses? And listen, if you know, you know. So we're not going to go down that road. But Jesus is dramatically revealing his glory so that his disciples could recognize that the going the way of the cross is, is not just the hardships that, as he describes them, that spiritually they need to follow this way of the cross. And I could see how it would have been easy for them to lose confidence in Jesus after all the negative statement of the Messiah being arrested and tried and killed, and, you know. And I could see how their concept of the Messiah didn't align with what Jesus was saying. But exactly because it didn't align, it was necessary for them to witness the presence of the glory of God shining out of Jesus. And he so dramatically showed them that cross bearers would receive glory. And he does that by he himself receiving glory in their presence. And you have to remember that for the ministry of Jesus, the goal isn't the cross, you know. A lot of the times when we think about Jesus' ministry and the crucifixion, we keep thinking that the cross is the goal. The cross is not the goal. The cross is the path to the goal. The goal is the glory of God that we win through eternal life. The cross is not the goal. The cross is the means to the end. The end is resurrection. The end is eternal life. The cross is just the bridge that we use to get there. And I think the disciples might have lost sight of that. Hmm? Thinking about human and earthly kingdoms, they might have lost sight of that. And it was necessary for them to understand that this hardship that Jesus was going to endure, that he told them yesterday they would have to endure, that this hardship was just a means to an end. Yeah? And I think that's a good place for us to switch over to St. Vincent de Paul and over to his companion. Yes, Louis. And St. Vincent de Paul was born in Gas Gascony. Is that how you pronounce it? In Gascony. Uh -huh. In 1580. And he was a regular peasant. I mean, he was an intelligent lad. And his, his father struggled to send to educate him because, of course, education was... Not the cheapest and easiest back then. And in send, being sent off to be educated, he was ordained because it was through the church. He was ordained at 20 and at first was interested chiefly in his successful career as an ordained priest. But by the time he was 30, he accepted a post as chaplain and tutor in the household of Philip de Gondi, who was the count of a region in that area. And in this position as tutor of the household, he was given the opportunity to be in contact with the peasants on the Gondi estate. Now, because of his education and his young age, right? Education lifts you out of a class of poverty. And even though he was a peasant, because he was intelligent, because he was educated, he was able to land that gig as tutor of the household. And as tutor of the household, he would have been regarded with a little bit of respect. His peasant stuck being left behind him. But as tutor of the, uh, of the estate, it brought him in contact with the peasant on the estate and he became concerned for their physical and spiritual needs. Hmm? Hmm. Coming from his background, that he, he was one who believed himself to be dying, right? Um, for the cause of Christ or willing to die for the cause of Christ. And one day as teacher on this place, he encountered a peasant who himself thought he was about to die. More impediment, urgency. And he comes to the priest, who is the tutor of the household, Vincent de Paul, and he comes to him and he confesses to him that his previous confessions for many years had been dishonest. So basically the man was saying, I go to confession all the time, but when I go, I don't tell the priest exactly what is going on. I tell the priest what is comfortable. And so Vincent began to preach in the local churches on the need for true confession, true repentance, in order to gain true forgiveness and the love of God. And his sermons began to draw such crowds of penitent that he had to call in groups of other priests to assist him. So it showed him two things. It showed him that his message was, was viable, 
but it also showed him that this man who thought he was dying that came to make a sincere confession was not the only one who had been pretending about confession all along. Yes? And because of the crowds that came, the crowds of penitent, Vincent decided that he would take on the pastorship of a neighboring church. Right? And this church that he was going to, because of the area in which it was, was attended by fashionable and, and, and aristocratic people. Yeah? And there he likewise drew many of the listeners to repentance and, and to amendment of, of lifestyle. But after a while, he was made to return to Paris and he worked among parishioners who were destined for the gallows. So they were going to, to, to be killed, right? And they, it was interesting because the, the, the gallows at the time, or the galley at that time, as it was called, was, was not just about being killed, but it was being sentenced to go on a ship where your fate was whatever become of you. And the best account of, of being sentenced to the galley is, is the novel Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Right. And the galley system is described in Les Miserables like, uh, very well there. And in that time, in ministering to these people in 1625, Vincent de Paul established a congregation of, of a missionary society known as the Vincentians or the Lazarists, yes? And it was a community of priests who renounced all the ecclesiastical advancement that could come. So they were just regular priests. They didn't want to move up in rank in any kind of way. They devoted themselves to work in the small towns and villages of France. They thought to themselves that Upward mobility in the ministry meant more administrative work and less of what the ministry was supposed to be about, service to the people, you know. And this was in an age of, um, yeah, not not much interdenominational courtesy. But Vincent de Paul, to the establishing of his new missionary society, the Vincentian, instructed his ministers that Protestants, non-Catholics, were to be treated as brothers and sisters as well, that they were supposed to be loved and respected without patronage or without any kind of um, um, contentiousness, without any kind of condescending behavior. And so at a time where the separation between Protestant and, and Roman was very, very high, these Vincentians, the followers of the mission that, that St. Vincent de Paul started, were set on providing ministry to people, not ministry to their own kind. And wealthy men and women came to him expressing a wish to amend their lives and he organized them into a confraternity of charity. Yes, and sent them to work caring for the poor and the sick in hospitals and visiting home for the age and, and regular homes as well. And then in 1633, the work he was doing was recognized by the Archbishop of Paris. And he was given the priory of St. Lazare as a headquarters. And out of these headquarters, he offered six times a year retreats for those who were preparing for ministry. And the retreat lasted two weeks each and would have about 80 students each day. Yeah? And then he began to offer these same type of retreats to lay people widening the variety of background of people who could come. And the whole idea of the retreats was identifying Lazarus or identifying with Lazarus in the parable of Lazarus from Bethany. You know? It was all about recognizing the need for death to the world and rebirth and the need for leaving the old life behind and seeking after a new and out of this place, he continued teaching. He used to have retreat for lepers. Um, and, you know, lepers, nobody wants to deal with them. Of course, all. It was both physical leprosy and spiritual leprosy as he deemed it. And his idea was all can be cured by the grace of God. And that dead men can be brought back to life. And that is what the St. Lazare house was all about resurrection and out of his co-fraternity of charity there arose an order of nuns called the daughters or the sisters of charity and these were devoted to nursing those who were sick and poor you know and 
taking care of abandoned babies as well. And of course, eventually, right? Eventually, he caught the attention of the king. And he complained to the king that ecclesiastical posts were distributed simply by political favor and that spiritual qualifications of the appointees were simply being ignored. And so the king created the Council of Conscience to remedy the matter. And he made St. Vincent, well, he made Vincent the head, he was not saved. And it was interesting because through that, yes, he then began to remove the partiality that existed in the ministry exercised around him. Of course, he died on the 27th of September in 1660, but the ministry of the Vincentians continues even to this day. And his example that he has left for us was that even from humble beginnings, yes, if you put all of your faith in God, he will take you in places where you can make a difference in the lives of other people. And the beautiful thing about the ministry of St. Vincent de Paul is that he did not just minister to the poor, he did not just minister to the rich, he did not minister just to Romans like himself, to Catholics like himself. He ministered to all who were in need. He did not show partiality of any kind. And then Louise de Mariac, yes, was the co-founder with Vincent de Paul of the Daughters of Charity. She was born out of wedlock, so she was deemed from her very early age as to as, as one who was not of good beginnings. She never knew her mother. Yes? But the Lord of Ferris, Louis de Maria, claimed her as his daughter and named her Louise de Maria. She was 22 when she was placed in an arranged marriage to Antoine Legras, who was the secretary of Queen Marie. Yes? And it was through them and that family she married into that she happened to meet Vincent de Paul and recognized him as a priest. But she recognized him as a priest because she had a vision. And in the vision, she was guided to a spiritual leader that would set her life on course. Her husband, Antoine, died and widowed and lacking finance she decided she would make a move. Vincent, at the time, was living near her dwelling with his house of hope, his Vincentian house. And his work was needing many helpers. And so she decided, you know what? I will go there. Because what Vincent was doing at his house was the same people who were in need were the same people who he was raising to treat or to help other people in need. And when she arrived, Vincent invited Louise to become involved in the work with the co-fraternities of charity. And she found great success in that. And in 1632, she became convinced that it was time to intensify her ministry to the poor and needy. Yes. And so a humble country woman, full of energy. Yes. She just began working and formation life for her. And then she invited the girls from the community to become a part of it. And the Daughters of Charity were unlike any other established religious community at the time. Right? Religious women were behind cloister walls and didn't really come out. They prayed with the love of the poor and, and, and honored them through their honor of Christ, but they didn't really go out. And Louise led the company of daughters out into the streets and up until, up until her death. And of course, her death, she became increasingly ill in health and, and, and died six months before the death of her friend and mentor, Vincent de Paul. She was young. She was 68. And by the time she died at 68, the Daughters of Charity had expanded to over 40 houses of committed women throughout France. Yeah? The nuns have always been held in high repute. And now have presence, of course, even in Marthe, the Daughters of Charity, all across the world. So it's two regular people who God used and placed in standings through which they could be used for ministry to those that were neglected, as well as to those who were neglecting them. 
And it's a beautiful thing to recognize when you look at the reading for this morning with regards to the transfiguration. A humble boy born to the carpenter and his wife. Jesus was a, as humble a beginning as Vincent de Paul and Louise. Yes? But it is this normalness in them that God chose to glorify true service to him. And that for me is touching because it is normal people like me and you that have the opportunity if we partner with God to make a difference in the world. You know? And sometimes I think Especially for those who are in ordained ministry. The ordained ministry brings us to a place where we get to see, experience, meet, and know very influential people. And we get to have an, an input in highly influential matters. And I think sometimes we allow it to go to our heads and we forget where we come from. Our prayer in ministry should always be Lord, help me to remain humble. Help me to remain or remember where you have brought me from, where you have brought me to, and use me to continue to raise up others the way you have raised me up. Vincent de Paul became so influential that he could influence the thoughts of the king. The glory of Jesus shine, shone through. At the transfiguration, a humble boy who the light through whom the light of God reached the world. Two good examples. And I pray that we recognize that just as we are exactly the way we are, the Lord sees us. And that He calls us to repentance and calls us to examine our lives, to change the things that need rectifying in order that we could be fully used for him. The ministry we are called to exercise is not one of which we should boast or one in which we should use the position God has blessed us with to lord it over other people. The idea of servant leadership is remembering and we will look at this and on our Mardi Thursday service that's coming up next week now. It is a life of service. To be a leader, one must first be a servant. Vincent was an excellent leader as he served his people. And of course, none exercises servant leadership like Jesus Christ. May we remember that no matter where we come from, the Lord has the final say in where we go. And as he carries us along, the way, it is our responsibility and our duty to make sure that as he has blessed us, we remain a blessing for this people. May the transforming and transfiguring light of God dwell in us and shine through us that we could continue transform his word. Amen. Let us continue with the profession of our faith. Words of the Apostles. Together we say, I believe in Father Almighty, the creator of heaven. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, Adam. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into death. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. Communion of saints, forgiveness of sin, resurrection of the body, life everlasting. The Lord be with you. As our Savior has taught us, so let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. I want to pray. For our suffrages this morning, we use suffrage B on page 40. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness and let your people sing joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. God, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth and your saving help among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken. Create in us clean hearts, O God. Sustain us with your Holy Spirit. For today we say the call it for the fourth Sunday. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son came down from heaven, be the true bread which gives life to thee. Evermore give us this bread, that we may live, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Together we say I call it for thanks. Most gracious God, who has bidden us to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before you. Teach us like your servant Vincent de Paul and Rufus de Mariac, to see and to serve Christ by feeding the hungry, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, and caring for the sick, that we may know him to be the giver of all good things, with the same Jesus Christ that. Today in our world cycle of prayer, we pray for the people of Cameroon, and in our ecumenical cycle of prayer, we pray for our sisters and brothers who are members of the Free Pentecostal Missions Church of Chile. Now, we turn to our own prayers of first and in the session, and thanks. For this morning, we have no birthdays listed for birthday greetings, and so we continue directly into our prayers for healing and recovery. We give God thanks for persons who have recovery, recovered from illness and surgery, and we continue to pray for healing and recovery for the following individuals. We remember and pray for Miss Judith, Miss Eileen, Miss Bonnie, Miss Rose, Miss Grace, Miss Sip, Miss Maria, Miss Norma, Miss Mary, Miss Kim, and Miss Joyce. Lee. We pray for Miss Monica, Sylvia, Miss Des, Miss Aislin, Miss Justine, Miss Lisa, Miss Soila, Miss Beryl, Miss Janet, Miss Marley, Miss Koya, Miss Nelita, Miss Molly, Miss Melancia, Miss Amelia, Miss Crystal, Miss Mark, Miss Anna, Dina, Miss Janet, Miss Marda, Miss Margaret, Miss Betty, Miss Martha, Miss Marva, Miss Gloria, Miss Celestina, Miss Jessica, Miss Rashawn, Miss Althea, Miss Teresa, Miss Amy, Miss Marie, Miss Agnes, Miss Lena, Miss Loretta, Miss Bar, Miss Ruby, Miss Arlet, Miss Yolani. Miss Janice, Miss Glenda, Miss Saloni, and Miss Felicia. We pray for Miss Priscilla, Miss Jean, Miss Anne, Miss Maud, Miss Ellie, Miss Delvery, Miss Lorraine, Miss Geraldine, Miss Myrtle, Miss Sonia, and Miss Petroga. We remember and pray for Miss Verilyn, Miss Carol, Miss Jasmine, Miss Alaire, Miss Lee, Miss Leah, Miss Tanya, Miss Robin, Miss Patricia, Miss Cap, Miss Fiona. Sweeter, Sweet City, Sulichi, Joan, Sisley, Marcia, Joyce, Skiron, Slinet, Emily, Estadia, Elva, Sharon, Reverend, Skinny, Skinny, Scapu, Scarlet, Sheila, Sweater, Sandra, Freddy, Jean, Stabisha, Dominic, Shannon, Slurry. Miss Michelle, Miss Sophie, Miss Jean, Miss Angela, Miss Carla, Miss Anne, Miss Lacey, Miss Tracy, Miss Dorothy, Miss Susan, Miss Kimball, Miss Shanice, Miss Julia, Miss Dennis, Miss Tessa, Miss Nathan, Miss Sharon. We remember and pray for the following of our brothers. We pray for Mr. Zane, Mr. Larry, Mr. Kendrick, Mr. Wilfred, Mr. Marvin, Mr. Philip, Father Eric, Mr. Jeffrey, Mr. Pony, Barry, Mr. Dudley, Mr. Finney, Mr. Mr. Oscar, Mr. Mr. Leon, Mr. Charles, Mr. Eric, Mr. Eve, Mr. Belhem, Mr. Levi Jr., Mr. Rupert, Mr. M, Mr. Robert, Mr. Rodney, Mr. Ismail, Mr. Clement, Mr. Walter, Mr. Edgar Jr., Mr. 
Mr. Carlos, Mr. Pablo, Mr. Hill, Mr. Alfred, Mr. Peter, Mr. Lee, Mark, Mr. Emily, Mr. Clinton, Mr. Luis, Mr. Sean, Mr. Constancio, Mr. Russell, Mr. Kirk, Mr. Donald, Mr. Crawford, Mr. Michael Samuels, Mr. Michael Severanis, Mr. Brindell, Mr. Ambrose, and Mr. We remember and pray for Mr. Gustavo, Mr. Lincoln, Mr. Grayson, Bishop Curry, J. Mark, Mr. Ernest, Mr. Chris, Mr. Trevor, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Carmen, Mr. Pete, Mr. Albert, Mr. Chad, Mr. Irving, Mr. Jervis, Mr. Omar, Mr. Lloyd, Mr. Kieran, Mr. Devin, Mr. Anita, Mr. Ted, Mr. Paul, Mr. Clayton, and Mr. Chuck. In our prayers, we continue to pray for persons who have contracted. Pray for those who are in isolation and care for persons in isolation. Pray for the availability of the vaccine, the blood tanks for that. Pray for the protection and protection of the spirit. In our prayers, continue and we are pray for all persons who are unable to pray for themselves. And we are pray for them together. Heavenly Father, I confidence in your love and experience your love. Jesus Christ, that gives me In our prayers, continue to remember and pray for all of our doctors and nurses and persons who work in the Remember and pray for the Arnold Mundell, Alba Shrew, Ken Akutu, Sosa, Young Bayer, Flores, and Masada. Pray for Nurse Martin, Nurse Gil, Nurse Grace, Nurse Lee, Nurse Herrera, Nurse Alberta, Nurse Olivia, Nurse Nurse Ashley, Nurse Bell, Nurse Kira, Nurse Lapitan, Nurse Lexi, Nurse Sheree, and Nurse Alejandra. Pray as you pray for those persons who have been lost in the life. Continue for the family of Miss Lamy Shannon, family of Mr. Gary Wood Hensley, family of Mr. Ed Stephen, family of Mr. William and Mr. Hope, family of Mr. Ed Guy, the family of Mr. The family of Miss Celia Mushjan, the family of Miss Lee Gillip, the family of Mr. Marlon Massaro, the family of Mr. Isaac Sunigan, the family of Mr. Stephen Jerry the family of Mr. Sylvester Bacador, and the family of Mr. Ishmael Clark. For all those who are here, possible, pray that God's blessings and comfort on you during the time of the day. Pray that those who In our prayers, we can take protection of the of the world. We remember and pray for our students, praying for Elisa, Tammy, Karina, Courtney, Aqua, Randall, Angel, Paige, Freedom, Garrett, Ashley, Ria, Rihanna, Kai, Arian, Jamal, and Pray for our loved ones. Pray for Jason, Charles, S. Derek, and Prince Charles, C. Candy, Christopher, Sam, David, and Now, first, we continue to pray for those who are those who are those who are those Homeless persons who live in situations of abuse and violence, pray for the pray for persons struggling with health challenges and persons struggling with substance abuse issues. In our prayers, we continue to pray for security for the government, for the churches, for the families, for all non government organizations and all. And for all persons in the position of our prayers, we continue to pray for the members of the for those ravaged by the effects of war and civil rights, those ravaged by the of for all persons in the of the continue to pray for them, to myself, and have each other against the ravages of the civil rights. The prayers of our hearts of the promise cannot be. Yes, we pray for Almighty God. Our intercessions by praying together. Almighty and eternal God, sanctify and govern our hearts and bodies in the ways of the laws and the works of your commandments. 
at ano yung protection sa 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 Christ na By means of announcement, brothers and sisters, I want to thank you so much for joining me this morning for my prayer. It is indeed a blessing and a privilege to be able to be you in your presence as well as in the presence of Almighty God. I want to apologize for last evening. We had some difficulty with the Zoom program and so we weren't able to get um, Bible study up and running last evening. Hopefully we'll be able to get that issue rectified for next week for Bible study um, on Thursday. Yeah, so we... Please do accept our apologies and of course we'll try to rectify what that issue was. With regards to broadcast schedule, today is Friday, so following this broadcast we have noonday prayers at midday, evening prayer at 5.30, Stations of the Cross virtually at 6.30 and Compline at 9 p.m. this of the day. We invite you to join us for any or all of these services as you are available and of course if you miss them at the scheduled broadcast time, you are always able to revisit the Facebook pages of the churches of the Anglican Diocese of Belize in order to catch a recap of our services. I want to thank you for your continued support of the work and the ministry of the Anglican Diocese of Belize. To wrap things up this morning with our prayer of dedication followed by the praise, the dismissal, and then our final day. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your home. May it be a lantern to our feet a light to our hearts and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and to serve our persons. Our the Holy Spirit and the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. The Lord be with you. Let us bless you. Thanks. We're going to close off this morning with one entitled, O oh Lord, Turn Not Thy Face From Me. This one that we are going to listen to is new to me, but I have come to like it. This is perhaps the second season of Lent that I'm using it in. And I like the way it is. As Jesus spoke of his hardships that were coming, and we see him in his glory preparing for it, we should never think that the difficulties we face in life is because God has abandoned us. He did not abandon his son in the worst hardship that was ever endured, and neither will he ever. May it always be our prayer, yes, that the gates of the Lord be open to us, and that our hearts be open. I do pray you have a blessed and beautiful weekend. Please do all you can to keep yourself and your family safe. Until Monday morning, same place, same time. God bless.